Welcome, and uh, we appreciate your attendance. Uh, we know that this is a busy day uh, here at the annual meeting, so we are very happy to have you with us. Uh, my name is Justin Bingham. I'm the city prosecutor for the city of Spokane in beautiful eastern Washington. Um, but also, I serve as the co-chair of the criminal justice section's pretrial justice committee. Much of the work of uh, that committee details ways that we can be more efficient and more effective in pretrial justice. Our committee, as we were contemplating different projects, uh, felt as though the need was there uh, to put together some type of panel that looks even be before uh, the work that we do in the criminal justice system uh, in the courts. And that's why we reached out to law enforcement, specifically the law enforcement committee, the criminal justice section, to put together a panel that really focuses on the things that law enforcement can do and are doing in the way of diversion. Today's panel is entitled Law Enforcement Led Diversion, Examples from the Field, because there is a lot that's going on in this area in the country. Uh, not just one program, not just two programs, but many, and many variations. And so uh, our hope uh, with the Pretrial Justice Committee, as well as the Law Enforcement Committee, uh, as well as the Alternatives to Incarceration Committee, uh, is to focus on spreading the word, if you will, of the great work that law enforcement is doing in assisting in the efforts of criminal justice reform. Uh, a key component of criminal justice reform is uh, really the focus uh, of increased use of diversion and deflection. Uh, law enforcement agencies are very well placed to effectively institute these programs since law enforcement is indeed the initial contact for most people that are involved in criminal justice matters. This panel will look to define diversion and deflection as well as give examples of successful programs. Uh, juvenile justice, mental health, substance abuse will also be key areas of focus for our panel today. Uh, in addition, uh, we're going to talk about how law enforcement-led diversion programs can help to build or rebuild community trust within uh, not only the reform community, but criminal justice system at large. Uh, the panel that we have uh, selected and comprised is really an all-star panel. The people that you see before you have been at the forefront of these efforts and have been working tirelessly for many years in these areas, and it's great to see them here today to explain and to uh, give you some ideas that maybe you can take back to your own communities. To my immediate uh, right is Judge Arthur Burnett. Judge Burnett uh, is retired, um, but before that, and actually I don't know if he's really retired, he's just more uh, moved to a different area of his career, uh, but he served as uh, the Attorney General's Honor Attorney in the Criminal Division of the Department of Justice. He was an Assistant U.S. Attorney. He was legal counsel to the uh, D.C. Metropolitan Police Department. He was a U.S. Magistrate Judge and subsequently a Superior Court Judge for the District of Columbia. Um, he's an honors graduate of Howard University and law review graduate of New York University School of Law. Um, but for the last 15 years, he has served with several nonprofit entities detailing and working in reforms in juvenile justice and criminal justice systems throughout the entire United States. Kermeline is a project manager at the International Associations of Chief Police, where she coordinates IACP's role as a strategic ally in the MacArthur Foundation Safety and Justice Challenge. That initiative uh, was created to encourage the uh, creation of just and effective local criminal justice systems. Uh, IACP provides support, training, and resources to law enforcement uh, and providers and uh, provides service uh, so that they can effectively and efficiently meet justice-related challenges in their communities. Uh, Karen is a leader in the IACP's liaison to the Police Treatment and Community Collaborative, PTAC. Uh, she also serves on the American Bar Association's Criminal Justice Task Force and Diversion Adjudication, 
Uh, before working at ICP, Karen worked for 28 years at Justice Research and Statistics Association, most recently as their Director of Communication and Member Services. Chief Anthony Holloway began his career in law enforcement with the Clearwater, Florida Police Department in 1985, and upon his retirement in 2007, he was selected as Chief of Police for the city of Somerville, Massachusetts. In February 2010, he rejoined the Clearwater Police Department as their chief, and then in August of 2014, uh, was selected and now serves as the Chief of Police for the St. Petersburg, Florida Police Department. Uh, Chief Holloway has a Bachelor's of Art in Business Administration as well as a Master's Degree in Business, business Administration. He serves as the uh, Chair of the Professional Standards Committee for the Florida Police Chief Association, Co-Chair of the Law Enforcement Committee for the Criminal Justice Section of the ABA, and Chair of the Florida Regional Community Policing Institute. Essentially, he's a really busy man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and beside him is another really busy man, Raul Ayala. Raul is the Collaborative Court's supervising attorney for the Federal Public Defender's Office in the Central District of California. Uh, he's been assigned as the lead deputy federal public defender for each of the uh, conviction and sentence alternative program uh, courts, uh, two in Los Angeles, one in Santa Ana, and one in Riverside. Uh, in addition, he is a team member on the Substance Abuse Treatment Reentry Program and the district's post-conviction reentry drug court. Uh, Raul has worked for several years as a uh, private nonprofit community law firm. Uh, he and several other school, uh, law school mates uh, established in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, he is a graduate of the University of California Hastings College of Law in San Francisco. Uh, Raul essentially does everything under the sun. No. Uh, and if you uh, didn't see him earlier, um, he uh, did an amazing panel on really the idea that we as criminal justice attorneys need to look at our own wellness and own self care. Um, Raul is currently not only the chair of the criminal justice section's alternatives uh, to incarceration committee, but he also is the criminal justice section uh, diversion standard task force uh, chair and serves as the co-chair of uh, many other um, entities within the ABA. So why really is this important? Uh, once people enter the criminal justice system, as we all know, it's hard for individuals to get out. Criminal histories matter. Avoiding arrest means avoiding cost for the criminal justice system and avoiding cost for the individuals that are in the criminal justice system. Uh, law enforcement on the ground is very uniquely placed and has a unique perspective on how to seek out what works and what doesn't. Law enforcement officers are problem solvers by nature and many of the challenges that we in the criminal justice system uh, have, uh, we ask law enforcement to solve, uh, whether it be mental health, substance abuse, or anything in between. So today we're going to really discuss how law enforcement can affect change, uh, specifically through diversion and deflection. Uh, to lead off our conversation today, I've asked Karen to provide uh, some input because she really does focus in these areas in her work for IACP. So Karen, if you could uh, start us off, and I believe we do have a uh, presentation uh, for everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Justin. Everybody can hear me? Great. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Justin for inviting me here to speak on today's panel about um, adult pre-arrest diversion programs, um, and I'm going to focus on adult pre-arrest diversion and how this process has started to evolve in this nation um, from a few, um, just a handful of programs in various places around the country, um, inconsistent programs, programs that we don't know really much or anything about because not only were they not really documented, but certainly not evaluated or anything, to a fully emerging field. Most jurisdictions around the nation still haven't experienced the culture shift that results in a department or an entire community when these programs are implemented, because for the most part, they're created in response to some sort of crisis. But in parts of the country that have been devastated by the opioid epidemic, like Ohio, Illinois, West Virginia, and most of New England, as well as you know a lot of other places in the nation, the 
agencies that have implemented these programs um, may never police their communities the same way again. Oops. That's me. I'm a project manager for the um, International Association of Chiefs of Police. Um, and I'm a project manager, like Justin said, for the Safety and Justice Challenge. Um, and it's funded, I said, by the MacArthur Foundation to change the way America thinks about and uses jails. And so um, IACP really came on to support law enforcement um, partners within the sites and to support the sites to get buy-in from law enforcement who were not really partnering with them. And we kind of fell into pre-arrest diversion and deflection as um, an arrest reduction strategy to help sites with their jail reduction strategies. So um, this message was posted on um, Gloucester Police Department's Facebook page in May of 2015. And it was groundbreaking. Um, it said, beginning June 1st, any addict who walks into the police station with the remainder of their drug equipment or drugs and asks for help will not be charged. And a lot of people didn't believe it, but one person who really needed help and couldn't get it because it's so hard for individuals to get treatment, they're put on wait lists. And when you're put on wait lists, you know, your resolve can disintegrate and you go back to using. Um, so. This was a groundbreaking effort in law enforcement, except that a year earlier in Lucas County, which is um, Toledo, Ohio, the sheriff had started reaching out to his community members to try to get people who were substance use um, abusers into treatment. And nobody had really heard about that, but um, uh, Chief Campanello made a ripple. And about a month later, Chief Fred Ryan from the Arlington Police Department made a similar type of decision, a little bit different. They said that when they arrest a drug dealer, instead of using his customer list as just evidence, they're gonna start reaching out to those customers, knocking on doors, and trying to get those people into treatment. And that became known as Arlington Outreach. So the first two programs like this that, that people really started to hear about were the Gloucester Angel Program and Arlington Outreach. Um, and I'll talk about how people started to hear about these and they just started, um, their switchboards blew up. How do we do this? How do we start this? This is such a great idea. And so these two um, police chiefs got together with um, some people from, um, I think it was Boston Hospital, something, UMass, um, they started an organization called PARI, the Police Addiction Assistance um, Recovery Initiative. And we'll talk about PARI a little bit later. And they came up with a couple of models for pre-arrest diversion. They now have over 400 members in 32 different states. And this is in four years. Dang it. So that was in response to drugs. What are the consequences, and Justin talked a little bit already about the consequences of arrest and incarceration, but most arrests are made for misdemeanor cases. According to an article in the Journal of Behavioral Health Research and Services last year, arrests for low-level misdemeanor offenses comprise the vast majority of law enforcement activity in the United States. National estimates indicated that the number of misdemeanor cases in 2006 exceeded $10 million, I mean, exceeded $10 million with more than two-thirds of adults having no prior arrest history taken into custody for the first time for misdemeanor offense. And there were approximately 738, 738, 90, 975 people in the nation's jails on any given day in 2013. Now, does anybody want to take a guess on how many of those people had been convicted of anything? How many people, in, what percentage of people in the nation's jails have been convicted of a crime? 30%. Higher. 45%. Higher. It's over 60% on average have not been convicted of a crime. They're there pre-trial, they're there because they can't afford bail, they're there because they have mental health or addiction issues. So, um, according to the most recent jail census, which was conducted by BJ, 
S in 2013, there were that many people in the nation's jails. Most of these individuals are pretrial and therefore presumed innocent, and most are there for nonviolent offenses, including traffic violations and nuisance crimes, or because they're mentally ill or addicted to drugs, and many are simply too poor to afford bail, even as low as $500. Being sent to jail in some jurisdictions can add to a person's debt since some jails and courts charge for the services they provide. In addition, jailing practices have had a disproportionate, in, disproportionate impact on communities of color. And nationally, African Americans make up only 13% of the US population, but are jailed at almost four times the rate of white Americans. These disparities can be even more blatant in some jurisdictions, like in New York City, for example. Blacks are jailed at nearly 12 times the rate of whites. And, less, and Latinos more than five times the rate of whites. And finally, the largest disadvantaged groups in jails by far are people with mental illnesses. Jails have been described as a treatment of last resort for those who are mentally ill and as de facto mental hospitals because they've had to fill the vacuum created by efforts over the last 60 years to deinstitutionalize people with serious mental illness. And justice involvement also leads to collateral sanctions like Justin was talking about already for individuals which negatively impact their role as citizens. And since he already went over these, and I have some, some really good things to get to, I won't really um, talk a lot about these, but you can see these on the screen. Um, denial of rights, benefits, and privileges, reduced opportunities, um, destabilization of neighborhoods. Um, and it actually impacts social uh, public safety because people that become involved in the justice system um, for as little as 48 hours are at risk for future criminality. Indeed, just like pre-arrest diversion programs popped up to address um, opioid use problems, there are um, a few pre-arrest diversion problems that were implemented to address the problems of collateral consequences. And most of these are in Florida and there are a few in North Carolina. So the role of police in public safety. Um, law enforcement usually get into their jobs because they care. And they have an obligation to enforce the law. They care about public safety. Um, but law enforcement can also be <clears throat> a numbers game. People are promoted and um, rewarded for the number of tickets that they give. They can be rewarded for the number of arrests that they make. And a lot of times officers don't like this, um, and they report that they don't like it, but that is the way that their um, agencies are run. Also, officers interact with individuals every day who are mentally ill and or um, have substance use disorders, and there is <clears throat> no capacity, <clears throat> excuse me, in their jurisdictions to deal with those types of people. There aren't. Um, centers or places to take them. There's nothing that they can do but arrest. Um, they're called the gatekeepers of the justice system. Um, however, when law enforcement is able to collaborate with public health or behavioral health, they are able to connect vulnerable individuals to treatment. So police can either be the gatekeepers to the criminal justice system or to community-based treatment, which can cause an end to the cycle of offending for these familiar faces. And they can be the gatekeeper to community-based treatment. And this brings me to pre-arrest diversion, the happy part of my presentation. So we have a variety of terms in this emerging field for pre-arrest diversion. Um, and I just want to go over these for a second because there are so many and, you, and you'll hear so many and it can be confusing, especially for law enforcement. Um, my boss at IACP likes to call it front-end diversion because that's totally understandable. If you hear front-end diversion, I think you assume that it's law enforcement-led diversion. Um, a lot of people just say lead, which can be um, misconceived because lead is an actual brand of pre-arrest diversion. It started in Seattle. Um, but that's what a lot of even policymakers in DC call it. Um, police assisted diversion is clear. Deflection. A lot of people like to say deflection because deflection is something that keeps people out of, you deflect people from the justice system. They never enter it at all. 
Um, crisis intervention teams deal with mental health issues, and that is like a team of law enforcement um, that helps with pre-arrest diversion. Crisis and triage centers are places. Sobering centers are places. Um, some of the first places that communities had to divert some people. And first responder diversion is a brand new term that the Bureau of Justice Assistance is using in response to um, the opioid uh, use crisis. And because um, law enforcement, sometimes you don't need them because EMTs will be the first people responding and fire will be the first people responding and they by themselves can take people to treatment and um, if they're the first people there, you don't even need law enforcement in the picture. So first responder diversion. So this gives law enforcement another tool in their tool belt. They have more than just arrest or warn and release, they now have diversion. So pre-arrest diversion is the handle to the front door. For years, we've seen how other parts of the justice system are able to use diversion um, in pretrial, in drug courts, prosecutorial diversion, jail diversion. And so if we look downstream and get to individuals who need it earlier, we can see if we can find success earlier for them so they don't even have to go into the system. This is called the, inter, uh, the sequential intercept model, and it was originally devised to show communities where they could intercept people with mental health issues um, within their criminal justice system. So intercept one was law enforcement. Law enforcement um, could, using CIT, to uh, crisis intervention teams, or um, a co-responder model, if they had the capacity in their community, could take people to crisis um, centers, triage centers, mental health centers, or emergency rooms that were equipped. Um, intercept two is um, initial detention. You can see the different intercept points throughout the justice system. You have um, jails and courts, and then um, re-entry and community corrections. Intercept zero is a brand new concept that uh, PRA, who, who kind of um, owns intellectually the um, sequential intercept model. They just added um, intercept zero about two years ago, and that starts in the community. So things like 311 instead of 911, um, first responders who aren't law enforcement, or even first responders that are law enforcement that take people right to triage centers. That is a brand new thing. So um, it doesn't. Intercept zero and intercept one don't have to involve the justice system at all, and that's what we call deflection. Oh, and by the way, um, if anybody's interested, this, this model can be used in communities, and Spokane has done it, can be used in communities to do, um, not training so much, but when you get your stakeholders together, you can do gap analyses with this and look to see what services you have, what services you need to start to look at your treatment capacity and um, develop more treatment capacity to be able to do these kinds of diversion models. So this is how pre-arrest diversion differs from other types of justice system diversion. And this is a really important distinction. The box on the left is pre-arrest diversion. And you can see that it's moving away from the justice system without having entered it while on the right, you're moving out of the justice system after you've entered it. So you're already starting to build up those collateral consequences. The box on the left is behavioral health guided with um, criminal justice partnerships, while the box on the right is criminal justice guided with behavioral health partnerships. So it's being overseen by a judge or a prosecutor. Um, and the box on the right is a public health solution to better public safety. While the box on the right, you have a wide variety of approaches for a variety of reasons. <clears throat> now, the nice thing about the pre-arrest diversion is if law enforcement, and there are some models where law enforcement, especially in smaller communities, know these people. They've seen these people cycle in and out of the system. And when they can see these people starting to succeed, um, and with opioid use disorders, they know there's going to be relapse. It's a chronic health condition. It's a disease. So 
law enforcement officers who are trained to understand the neuroscience of addiction know that these people are going to relapse. So there's not this disappointment. And there's not this, you know, they don't create this stigma that they're disappointed in them. Um, they work to get them into treatment again, um, which is the nice thing about these, these, these first three pathways I'm going to tell you about. But um, places where law enforcement doesn't necessarily know the people that they've diverted, what we try to tell them is have people who are successful come back and do this feedback loop and let them know what they're doing now, that they've helped them, that they're successful, because these will help pre-arrest diversion programs. And I stick it up here in this part of my presentation because sometimes I forget at the end of the presentation, but this feedback loop is so important to continue to get buy-in from law enforcement agencies in bigger communities where they don't necessarily see the same people all the time. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the five pathways, because this is the, the important part, of the Police Treatment and Community Collaborative. PTAC was started um, really just two years ago um, after a summit that IACP hosted. Um, the person who started the Civil Citation Network in Leon County or Tallahassee, Florida, and the person that is the executive director of the Center for Health and Justice at TASC wanted to try to get people that they knew that were working in various parts of pre-arrest diversion around the country together to start a national initiative so they could start to bring these programs together, study them, get a census of them, and start to work to advocate for them across the country. And PTAC was born in April of 2017. Since then, we've had one national training and technical assistance conference, and we have um, six or seven working groups, and it's stuck, and um, we're still working on things. So these are the five pathways that PTAC has identified for pre-arrest diversion. And this is a very busy slide, and I will break it down for you, but this is a visual that we came up with to kind of illustrate what these pathways are. And we call them pathways to community or pathways to treatment because as you can see from the bottom of the slide, Communities have shared problems, challenges, and concerns, and if you work your way up through these five pathways and treatment and social services, the community has shared goals and outcomes. You can get people to community services at the top. So here's kind of an easier way of looking at it. These five pathways, the first one is self-referral, which was like the Gloucester program, where individuals can walk into a police station or um, a fire station, ask for help, and a volunteer, after they have an intake with a law enforcement officer or a volunteer, a volunteer will um, find treatment for them either in the community or somewhere close to the community and take them to treatment as soon as possible, usually within hours. Active outreach is where law enforcement who knows where these people are or if a community, I mean a family member, contacts law enforcement, they will reach out to the person to try to get them into treatment. And then naloxone plus has to do with Narcan, naloxone. When an, o, when an overdose is reversed, successful reverse of an overdose, they don't just say, okay, you know, you're in the emergency. They never just walk away. Within 24 to 24 hours, they are knocking on that person's door to try to get them into treatment. So a lot of law enforcement agencies say, we don't carry Narcan, why bother? You know, this person's just gonna use again. So this is the answer to that. You don't just walk away. You work on that person to get them in the treatment. None of these first three models of pre-arrest diversion are ever coercive. And they're never used to get information about a dealer or any other crimes. These are done with law enforcement officers in polo shirts and khakis, plain clothes, plain cars. There are communities where car dealerships donate cars for these, um, these programs so that they have enough plain cars to use. Um, these are community building programs. It's super cool and I have lots of examples of that. So the first three deal with um, substance use disorders and the third one is particularly for opioid use disorders. The fourth pathway to treatment is officer prevention referral. And that is mostly for mental health, crisis intervention teams, co-responder models, responding to somebody in crisis. Um, or it can also be veteran um, uh, diversion or deflection. Or um, they use it in lead for, for uh, sex crimes, um, kind of no wrong door. Um, 
almost anything, young adult diversion, anything that a community sees as a problem can be answered with diversion. And some communities are looking at um, felony diversion because think about a felony. I mean, an iPhone now is $1,000, you know, and um, we're talking about some things, sneakers that have gone up in price. Those are, those are felonies now. Um, and then officer intervention um, referral is the only one where charges are held in abeyance. So that's kind of a carrot stick approach. So, um, but still not coercive. Somebody will say, if you want to have your charges dropped and not have a criminal record, you have to go through this program. When you complete it, the charges will be dropped and you won't have a record. So those are the five pathways to treatment. And here's some of the brand names that some people will recognize. For um, self-referral, you've got your ANGEL program. Um, another one that's kind of famous, maybe just in Illinois, is A Way Out. Um, a Way Out and Safe Passages have both um, started to be evaluated. Um, and there may be some in your communities that you've heard of. Naloxone Plus, big in Ohio, but actually most um, agencies that have any kind of diversion program have a Naloxone Plus program. But the, the big ones are QRT and um, the DART one, which was the first pre-arrest diversion for OUDs ever in the country that we know of. And that's the one that Sheriff Tharp started in Ohio, in uh, Toledo. Officer Prevention Referral, um, LEAD is, is the biggest one. They have, I think now, maybe 23 sites around the country. Seattle was the first one. Um, and they divert um, people who are homeless, people who have um, substance use problems. It's a harm reduction program. So you can't be kicked out of LEAD for messing up. They understand that people are gonna mess up. So you just get a different kind of treatment. Your case manager moves you to a different kind of, of treatment and works with you on that. And then officer intervention. Um, civil citation, which Chief Holloway is going to talk more about. Um, the STEER program in Maryland, where they actually use a citation booklet, a ticket book, to do assessment on the spot and then divert people into treatment. Um, and a really cool program that was started by the prosecutor called the Goldilocks Project, which I love. I think it's super cool. So while there's not enough evaluation to say if these programs really work yet, um, this is what the hope is. And th there have been some evaluations started, but, but when you have programs that are started due to a need, you're responding to a crisis. And so you do what you can and you do what's best, and then you start to evaluate later. This is what we think is happening. Um, reduced crime, reduced drug use, reduced mortality. That's the first thing we go for. But what we know is happening is build, it's building police community relations. We know those things are happening. Um, there have been a few evaluations. Um, we also know that it's helping to keep families intact. Um, and we're hoping that it's addressing racial disparity. In PTAC, we have a community equity and diversity working group. And one of their main goals is to make sure that deflection is happening with equity. So this is what the research is telling us, and this is one slide that I am going to read because I think this is important. If I can find it. So pre-arrest diversion programs have successfully engaged many adults with one program serving over a thousand participants over a four-year period. Parti programs designed especially for adults with severe SUDs have served fewer participants, but these programs have high engagement, referral, and retention rates. Pre-arrest diversion programs assess and address behavioral health needs associated with continued involvement in the criminal justice system. Results from the ANGEL program demonstrate a high 95%. Direct referral to treatment rate for participants with OB opioid use disorder, which is higher than emergency department-based initiatives, and it's a lot higher than individuals can get their own treatment. Um, preliminary results indicate participants who fully engage in pre-arrest diversion programs tend to have low rates of recidivism for extended periods of time. So this is the PTAC website. It's, it's really a white slide. Sorry about that. But 
It has a resources section on it that we try to keep up to date. Um, we're all volunteers in this program, so unfortunately it's not a first priority for anybody, but we work really hard to try to keep it up to date. So you can go on there to look for um, the latest research articles, um, evaluations, and things like that. But you can also look at the working groups and see um, recommendations that they have up there for behavioral health and um, community. And PTAC is having another training and technical assistance conference November 10th through the 13th, and the information is in the, um, the conference section. And I can tell you a little bit about it later, too, if you would like to know. And then this is the Safety and Justice Challenge website. We have three webinars on there about pre-arrest diversion. Um, and finally, if you guys have any questions after this, I'm sorry it's kind of long, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks. Thank you, Karen, for uh, laying out sort of what we're doing and why we're here. Um, I'm going to turn over to Chief Holloway to really talk about sort of, as Karen mentioned, a lot of these programs are built because of a need in a particular community. There, there's a crisis or officers see something and they know that they need to act. Maybe you can talk about how you and your community uh, have seen issues and you've sort of addressed them through the work of your department. Sure, and thank you, uh, Justin, for inviting me here today. So like Karen said, I really think she really hit, uh, hit a good point. We talked about law enforcement. So when I first went to a St. Pete Police Department, the biggest thing we talked about was community policing. And when you start looking at it, officers are rewarded for how many arrests they make and then how many citations. So the first thing you have to do, you have to turn that culture around. So now if, if you get a promotion or a transfer, the question you, you get asked now is, how many people you know in the community? How many kids are you mentoring in the community? And every officer, he or she has to walk one hour a week, not make an arrest, but go out there and meet people. So that's what you're starting to be asking questions on. So it took about four years for us to start turning this around. So when we start talking about that and we start to get to know our community, then we started talking about diversion. And you're a different thing. Our program is called Second Chance. And we always start off with a conversation is how many people in this room have never, never made a mistake in their lives? And everybody's gonna raise their hand. So we said, okay, so instead of making that arrest, how can we change that? So what we do is any juvenile that is, is charged with a misdemeanor, he or she, if she admits on that day that they did wrong and their parents agreed to it, they go into a second chance program. And what that is is, so Monday through Thursday, if, uh, if they're charged with a misdemeanor, they show up that Saturday morning. For the first six hours, they do some type of community service. In the last two hours, they work with counselors to figure out what is that problem, how can we solve that problem. So if that child has been stealing, why did they steal? What caused them to commit that crime that they've done? In Pinellas County, our, our success rate is right now, we average about 98% of the kids that we come in contact with are diverted or second chance. In the state of Florida, the ratio is 61%. So that shows you a difference of how uh, the county and how the city's working on diverting those kids. So, and then we're also starting to look at some felonies because, you know, a bike nowadays is $1,000. So if that child steals a bike, he or she could be charged with that felony. So we're looking at what are some of those felonies uh, that, that are their first time offense, and the child does get three strikes at the apple, so to speak. Uh, they'll go through our diversion program, then the sheriff has also two more steps in that diversion program. The biggest thing we're gonna be looking for right now is, since we've done this program for the past four years, where are these kids now? You know, wh where are they in society? Have they reoffended? Uh, so we're, we're trying to track it that way. We also have another program uh, that we have that help the kids, and this is, they can volunteer to go this and this is called either men in the making or women in the making and again once they have been charged with something they can go work with volunteers and in that group of volunteers there are men and women from the police department so you're building that relationship so they come every saturday and they start to work with each other uh, we have seen uh, we reported this year in the state of florida that crime reduction at st petersburg police department is down by 20 percent that was the highest in the four counties that surround us. So diversion is working. Everybody was a little bit nervous of that, saying the more you divert people, the more your crime's gonna go up. And I can tell you that's not true. The more you divert, 
the more you become part of the community, the more you start working with those kids and they see those kids and they realize that they made a mistake and it's not going to be held against them. Because if, if you know down the road when they either apply for to go to college or for the military, they're gonna, that's a strike against them. In the military right now, they'll tell you, if you have a felony record, you're not going. If you have a felony charge out there, they're not going to accept you. So how are you going to get it out of that cycle and how are you going to break that cycle? Uh, so really, that's what we have going at our department and, and should say in the county. In Pinellas County, there are 24 different municipalities. So we're all on the same uh, sheet of music, meaning that uh, every child shall be diverted. And the key word is shall, uh, because if you try to take that child down to a juvenile detention center, and if it's his or her first time, they're going to tell you to take that child back to your agency and contact your supervisor to see why you brought that child out. So while we're on this topic of uh, juvenile justice, uh, Judge Burnett, you've recently co-authored an article in our criminal justice uh, magazine. Uh, can you maybe just give a, a general idea to the, the group about uh, what the article is about? Uh, it was really focused on citation because, as we discussed earlier, once you arrest, it sets everything in motion. Well, basically the article in the current issue of Criminal Justice Magazine that just came out uh, talks about a program in Florida where instead of a kid being, quote, arrested, they use a citation much like a traffic ticket approach where they refer the kid to a program diversion without the police even getting involved at that point, which frees up police officers to deal with serious adult crimes. Indeed, in a proposed draft earlier, uh, my co-author had a graph indicating that in a year they had saved over $3 million in police time and so forth by using this citation system. In the District of Columbia, uh, I was the catalyst back in 1995 to convince our Superior Court of D.C. to authorize or participate in a youth deferral program and establish a youth court of the District of Columbia with Antioch Law School, now merged into the University of the District of Columbia School of Law. And the board of directors, the board of judges, and the chief judge agreed with my recommendation and that of Edgar Kahn, and we established a youth court of the District of Columbia, which was then called Times Dollar, as a nonprofit entity, but because of the relationship to the court system, the court entered a memorandum of understanding where on Saturdays we could use a courtroom where kids get to see the real life of what happens when you're formally arrested and charged. And with the threat being held that if you don't show up for the program when you're referred, you and your parent, or guardian, or caretaker, will be referred to court. The caretaker could be charged with uh, neglect and abuse, or what they call persons in need of supervision, by the then Corporation Council, now the Assistant Attorney General, where the parent or caretaker doesn't take the responsibility seriously to cooperate with the program, can be brought in court, and the parent can be kind of persuaded or coerced into getting the child into the program. And, and so then the child would be in a, put in a six week program where the child would either admit or say, I do not contest. Matter of fact, I've had the experience where a couple of kids that say, I was charged with aiding and abetting, but I told the kid not to break the window of the car to steal the tape recorder that was on the seat. And when the police came or was coming to search, I figured that they would accuse me. So I ran, and when the police tackled me and caught me before, I gave them a false name because I didn't want my parents to learn about my being, being with this group of people. And I said, well, why don't you go to trial and tell, tell the judge that? I'm going to be killed right out of my... None of those white judges are going to believe me. So we got the implicit bias issue and so forth. So black kids perceive that if they go before a white judge or in adult cases, they go before a jury, which is eight or nine percent white, that even if they acted under coercion or they acted because 
they didn't want to be involved or they feared that the police was going to try to entrap them to be a part of a conspiracy involved with drugs and so forth. So I've had adult defendants end up pleading guilty before me to lesser included offense to cooperate with the government. And then that, uh, sometimes 16 to 17 year old youngsters in juvenile situations the same way, end up testifying against the kingpins. Then we get judges and magistrates dealing with complicated habeas corpus petitions as to whether the kid who got a break or a young adult who got a break, in fact, exaggerated his or her testimony to escape a 10-year mandatory sentence. So we dealt with this youth court operation effectively from 1995 until about 2014 when the Republicans took part over the Congress and the Justice Department stopped transferring money to the District of Columbia, to the mayor's office of discretionary funds the youth court stopped operating because they didn't have funding. So the last three or four years, I, along with a major advisor, has been attempting to get the city government to adopt and reactivate youth court with the District of Columbia. And we have a political issue involved. The District of Columbia court system is under federal control. The Superior Court is both a federal court and a state court combined. So the city said, we are responsible for that Congress appropriates money. So we've been in that kind of catch-22, where the districts say, it's a federal responsibility. We don't have control over our court system. And children, I would say, when I say you have control over the elective abuse situation, termination of parental rights, adoption, moms on prostitution, so forth. So I've tried to persuade the mayor to say that this is a district responsibility and they ought to establish a contract or a grant program where community associations can do what youth courts, teen courts are doing around the country. And indeed, I've talked to the chancellor of the school system saying, dealing with the issue of bullying in schools. And in bullying in schools frequently involve threats to do bodily harm. They frequently involve fights, which are assaults. They frequently involve destruction of property, tearing another kid's clothes off them, or stealing, even stealing their, their tennis shoes, or part of their clothing, or so forth. Uh, or tan pages of their school books. And I had the chancellor uh, now considering adopting the citation or kind of administrative referral to youth, what I even call the police officers into arrest and drag a kid across the floor, as you saw on television a couple of years ago. And the idea is, number one, collateral consequences. That child, if you're given a traffic ticket, usually isn't precluded in college or doesn't lose an opportunity for a scholarship. But if they have a juvenile arrest record, they may very well not get into college the charge that they want to get into. So I got this, the chancellor seriously considering using the civil citation approach used in Florida to refer bullying cases, which has been a major problem, and sometimes even sexual harassment cases, or boys sometimes illicitly touching young teenage girls, 12, 13, 14 years of age, sexual molestation. It may not be rape or so forth, but yet in, inappropriate, indecent activity or so forth. And so we are considering that possibility in D.C. And I happen to also be one of the founders of the National African American Drug Policy Coalition. And we have taken on as a tour partnering with Youth Court to provide those kids with counselor mentors at, who come in a system where parental control is not sufficient, where parents are either a mother prostitute, drug addict, and I even talked with the uh, head of the city council about having senior citizens uh, volunteer to be temporary guardians and paid a guardian adopt subsidy, like adoption subsidy for the kid. I had one case of a young girl came to me when I was speaking to her in the school, to a group along with Janet Reno. I said, Judge Bernay, I'm a straight A student in the seventh grade or eighth grade. I want to be a lawyer and get to be a judge like you. I make straight A's. But my mom is a prostitute and selling drugs say, I'm not going to be anything but a bitch and a whore anyway. Will you and your wife adopt me? I've had kids to actually take that approach. So we have pending before the city council now the concept of temporary guardianships for some of these kids who may get in trouble for, quote, shoplifting because they were 
walk into a drugstore with someone else that stands up, but then the whole group ran, and they, all of them get arrested. So we're trying to deal with those situations by providing counselor mentors for these kids, providing tutors for them when they're in fact of a low grade level in performance, and then encouraging them to be good students and not get involved in drugs, engage in juvenile delinquent behavior, by even promises of internships and apprenticeships once they get to be juniors and seniors in high school. I have one young man whose father had been in prison six times for heroin conviction. And he was, before I me, mean, I took him on as an intern uh, working in my office after school. After about four or five months, he said, Judge, I'm going to leave living with my mom. I'm going to go live with my grandmother where I can study and be a good student like you. And I want to get to be a lawyer to help kids who were being subject to the life I had. And we have those kind of treatments. So sometimes these kids, when they go through youth court or teen court or whatever name you call it, in fact, will volunteer even after that 30 days or 60 days and become part of the management of volunteers in youth court in DC. And we had a, a recidivism rate when it was operating from 95 to 2015 of four or five percent of the kids even getting in trouble. The only problem was it was only a year or two years after the event and some of the people, the politicians, were, well what about did you get in trouble in Maryland? Or did you get in trouble in Virginia? Or what about a five year or longer duration? I also happen to be the scholar in residence to a group called Global Youth Justice. It's headed by Scott Peterson who was a program manager for 11 years in the U.S. Department of Justice with reference to OJGDP operations and grants to community organizations. And he started a corporation called Global Youth Justice Incorporated. I'm the vice president of policy, a vice president period, but primarily of policy and advocacy. And we have 1,800 youth court or team courts that are functioning in this manner across the country. And we are promoting, adopting, and incorporating some of the things that are being done in Brooklyn and in Pens and in uh, Florida, and now with, we're going to be working closely with my colleagues sitting next to me with reference to what we're trying to do all over the country. 50% of the work of the National African American Drug Policy is, I'm not going to say a Nancy Reagan approach, or just say no to drugs, it is also to say yes to academic achievement, to excel it, and bringing in black judges, Hispanic judges, Hispanic professionals in other fields to show examples of, of kids that we were kids like them once, but we rose from poverty and now we're judges, lawyers, doctors, dentists, et cetera, and so forth, so that they can see reality. I've gone into schools and given talks for one hour and end up leaving school at the end of the day where the principal of the school is canceled. Classes for the day and just had me ride circuit, you might say, to talk to eight or nine different places, and I've, and I've given pep talks from 11 o'clock in the morning until 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon throughout the entire school. One of the things that happened in D.C. as a result of my being the chief judge of community relations was that in 15 years we had no drugs in any of the schools in the District of Columbia. They had drugs in schools in Northern Virginia. But they said, this is Judge Burnett's school. We're not going to have any drugs here. And so forth. So, Thank you, Judge. Let's, let's get back a little bit to uh, an issue that we've, I, I've sort of noticed is we're talking about all these programs. And Roel, I'd like to get your uh, idea on uh, one particular issue, and that's the fact that throughout this conversation for the last hour, we haven't mentioned lawyers once. Uh, you're a pretty uh, <clears throat> astute defender. Um, what, what is the view? of the defense of these programs? Because you really aren't part of the equation. Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it something we should be concerned about? Uh, thank you, Justin, for inviting me and for, for the question and for you for being here. Well, first of all, as a federal defender, we don't have too much, you know, uh, warning release, right? Can you imagine a, D a DEA agent, you know, <laughs> stopping you and saying, well, don't do that again and I'll see you later, right? Or, or an FBI agent, don't think about robbing that bank. So I don't have much personal experience, and I can't speak on behalf of the entire bar, but these are some of my initial thoughts, right? Is, is when there's police contact, should there be probable cause? 
right? You know, we don't want to, we got to be careful about net widening, right? I, I, I trust my, my brethren police officers to try to do the right thing, to try to help somebody who may appear to be in need, or who may be driven by some addiction or mental health issues. Um, but when we're talking about a diversion program where we're going to ask them to do something, you know, have it have at least some probable cause basis. Otherwise, it's a straight civil referral. You might bring in the, the program like 311 or, you know, pass them off, right? So that's, that's one issue. The other issue, you know, yes, we're, as a defense lawyer, always interested in somebody not getting arrested, somebody not getting booked, somebody not getting charged, somebody not pleading guilty, somebody not being sentenced. And, you know, of course we're interested in that. Um, uh, and so there's, there's this tension, of course, between, well, we want to make sure that, you know, that happens, you know, but we're not on the street anyways. Even, even the regular cases that come through, we're never with our clients when they get arrested, right? So we can't control that particular uh, scenario. But if they're going to be asked to do something, right, in exchange for being arrested, then all, all I would ask is that they obviously have some type of informed consent that they know what they're getting into, right? If they, you know, some, some of them are very informal. Hey, you know, you've got a little bit of drugs here, whatever the case, we're not gonna arrest you, we're gonna refer you to a, a treatment program. God bless you, and please don't sin again. Or, you know, we're gonna, we have a program, where we're gonna follow up, we're gonna refer you to a program, we're gonna give you X amount of days to report, we're gonna follow up to see if you got there, right? So there's some expectation of some type of compliance. So, uh, you know, giving the, giving the participant some opportunity to seek some advice. Obviously, you're not going to call a lawyer to show up right then and there, uh, but have, you know, advise that person that if you have any questions, you have a right or you should be able to, to consult with somebody. Um, I think that it's been mentioned here uh, by Chief Holloway is, you know, community collaboration is, is, a, is a beautiful thing if we really put our minds in and make it work. So if a police department and or DA's office is thinking about putting something like this together, we, defense counsel, public defenders, whatever, you know, should be at the table to discuss this, even if the goal is to never effectuate an arrest. Now, why is that, right? Obviously, we need to make sure that uh, you know, we don't net widen, that there is, you know, uh, uh, some, some, some acceptance and realization of procedural due process, that uh, there is informed consent, that they are given the opportunity to consult with somebody if there's a question. So I think that uh, uh, at the very least we want to be uh, a stakeholder in that entire process because many times, you know, if, if it's a straight deflection program, okay, or, or what happens when they don't show up? is going to be referred to a uh, prosecutor? Um, what happens if the program is designed to write a statement of probable cause? You know, what about giving statements by the, by the, the participant, prospective participant, or prospective arrestee? They make a statement and that's recorded. You know, so we need to have some, you know, procedural safeguards. So if we, if we talked about all of these and make sure that in that particular jurisdiction at the public defender's office, sees themselves as a partner, right, is, is willing to give resources to that program if and when necessary, uh, maybe has somebody on call, just like they might have a district attorney on call if there's a, a real issue, so that, so that uh, everybody uh, feels, including the defense bar, that there is um, due consideration to the, you know, the, the procedural rights of the person that's out in the street. Um, and then, you know, of course, uh, uh, there's a say about what kind of what kind of treatment is out there, and what can we do as a defense bar to help, you know, uh, identify those resources, maybe to to uh, uh, assure not, not 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 necessarily funding, but for example, in Los Angeles County in the state of California, we've gone to a Medi-Cal model, right, where most of these services are provided at the at the public expense, right. So what do we do? You know, we don't, we don't, we're not the direct providers, but we help our clients uh, make sure that they qualify for Medi-Cal. You know, even, even, that's the first stop, even when they're in our system, pretrial probation, 
typically will not pay for the resources if you qualify for Medi-Cal, right? So, so those issues of, of, uh, of, of uh, identifying you know, who's, who's eligible and how they're gonna be screened and what's the procedural process gonna happen and what are the resources that are gonna be given, all important factors for the defense board to, to be part of the conversation. Karen, you have some data on that. Right, so um, one thing I wanted to say is you're absolutely right. Defenders need to be at the table. Um, when these programs are done um, in a methodical way, um, which now that people are learning about them, they are actually implemented that way. So when we're um, doing training and technical assistance in a community to build one of these programs, we ask that, that they come in teams. And so we ask that there be um, somebody from law enforcement, behavioral health, um, and the community, That's, that is, a team that has to be there. You have to have those three components. And then after that, have somebody from the defense, have somebody from the prosecutor's office, have somebody from probation and parole, and have a judge. Because say somebody walks in for self-referral, say they have a warrant. The policy of most um, angel programs is not to automatically turn that person away. It's to call the judge or, or somebody to um, to try to um, get that warrant taken care of. Or um, say that person is on probation and the only treatment facility is out of state, which happens all the time. There's, there's, for some reason, there's a lot in Florida. Um, they'll call that person's probation or parole officer to, to try to work out taking that person to treatment. And in a lot of these communities, because everybody has implemented this program, planned this program together from the very beginning, they can work those issues out um, everybody's a part of the program, all the way from the community to the judge. And so um, that's a really good point that you made. So um, when these programs are planned out well and the policies are written well, and the nice thing about this PARI website that I was telling you about, um, the police, um, oh God, it's so long, assisted, Police Addiction Assistance Recovery Initiative, they have a whole library on their site so that no community has to start from scratch. People upload their policies, their volunteer documents, their MOAs, their data sharing agreements. They're all up on that site so people can borrow those and um, you know, look at those and see if they can they use those for their um, communities. And so, um, yeah, it's very much a collaborative effort. Those are the efforts that work the best. So Chief, I wanted to ask you a question uh, really about how these programs are implemented uh, specifically to deal with uh, disparity uh, and to deal with sort of equal application because I know that one of the concerns uh, in the country is that law enforcement uh, seems to be focused on arresting persons of color over other individuals. That's a perception that's out there. How do, do these programs help to eliminate that perception and really try to push uh, programs out in a very equal handed manner. Can you sort of talk about how you've been able to accomplish that in, in your community? Sure, so it doesn't matter what community you come from, color, uh, if, you if you're arrested for that misdemeanor, you're dealt with just like anyone else. So, and then we track, uh, we track a lot of things. So we, we track how many times an African American is arrested reference to a white male or a white female. And, and then we look at that officer. It, where is that officer working, number one? Is that officer working in a white community and he's arresting more African American than he's arresting white? Then that's a training issue. We need to put someone out there with him. Uh, and again, like I said, no officer has the right or the authority to take any child into custody uh, that has, not, has never been convicted of a misdemeanor. They're gonna to have to go through the diversion program. And if they do do that, then they get some type of counseling now. Because the question would be, do you understand the general order? Uh, because the order says you will not take that child to a juvenile detention center. So those are backtracks. So everything is really documented uh, correctly. I, I was just looking at, so this past month, we arrested 19, I'm sorry, there were 19 juvenile eligible for a diversion program. Of those 19, 18, uh, were diverted and one was arrested because he or she probably didn't meet the criteria for it. So, so Chief, um, what, do you, what do you think? How do we, how do we expand this beyond, because you guys have talked about juvenile. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, Judge Burnett has a, a uh, position on, on that. On that very question, I've worked with the Richmond, Virginia Police Department 
and the community relations person there is a black woman. And they and the chief of police established an advisory committee of teenagers. The advisory committee of teenagers I swore in. The composition was well balanced with black, white, Latino students. And in addition, they also developed a program of two days of going into schools and being officer friendly and talking to kids about being there to protect the community. And they even engaged in playing basketball with the kids on basketball courts in the black communities. And, it's per and she is one of the high ranking officials in Noble, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives across the country. And they are trying to emulate that program. So that's a kind of model program, which in fact pulls in all sections. Then they speak to civic groups, PTA groups, and recreational centers. And they go in and they become also friendly and get to know people by first names and their crime problems go way down. So Judge, you see these diversion programs as sort of having dual benefits, one, reduction of crime, but also increase in community uh, engagement with law enforcement? Not only that, but also to improve in our schools, reducing the dropout rate, reducing truancy, improving the quality of education, and interrupting the school discipline to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. So, it, and indeed, uh, one further aspect of the matter, and I'm talking to you, AARP now. You say, why are you talking to AARP? That's the Association of Retired People. Many senior citizens retired 55 or 60 and they sit at home or they sit in senior citizen home watching television all day. And I've had some of them say, I would love to work with a teenage kid and get them to be a banker, get them to be a doctor or a dentist. So I'm not just sitting around waiting to die. So we're working with AARP Foundation to come up with funding, to come up with consular mentors who are senior citizens who have out of time on, on the hand, and rather than just watching TV all day and, and sitting in, in, what, in a rocking chair, they feel that they got a mission in life. I had a 96-year-old banker in California who stayed and gave me this idea. Say, I'm just sitting here, so I would like to take two or three kids and force them to become economists a CPA, a financial expert. So I feel like I'm doing something useful with my life. So I'm right now in negotiations with AARP to fund a program in DC where we set up a pilot program of kids who want to go into the business entrepreneurship field. And let's deal with senior citizens who are still mentally alert, maybe wheelchair bound, or with one instance, be a pianist player or artist or concert and find a kid. My oldest, my oldest daughter, for example, when she was 15 and 16 years of age, every Thursday would go to a senior citizen home and talk with people. And today she's a lawyer in four different states and DC and a CPA. And, and the people said, she was great. She was what gave me zest to live. So there are permutations of not just preventing these kids from getting, uh, say, added to mass incarceration and continuing down the stream, but to turn them around to become leaders of our society. Thank you, Judge. So, Chief, what, what does come next in the uh, diversion uh, realm for law enforcement? Uh, where, where do you see it expanding? Well, I, in our county, I can see, and we've already started, where we start to look at adults, uh, because that was the next step. Uh, seeing that disparity there where, uh, again, Pinellas County has 24 different municipalities, so the sheriff and the police chief we've got together, and we said that if someone is arrested for marijuana, whether they're from a low-income area or high-income area, they're going to be treated the same way. Their first-time offense is not a citation because maybe that person cannot pay that fine. Uh, so the person, again, working with our public defender's office, if they admit, admit uh, to that crime, then they're set up under the version and some type of community service. So uh, there was some pushback from the officers because you take that discretion away from the officer because the officer can't say, well, I'm going to take this person to jail, but I'm not going to take that person to jail. You don't have an option. If you're going to charge that person with possession of marijuana, that's fine. And you're going to follow these steps. So I can see 
that the diversion is going to start going up into the adults also. Uh, but that's going to take all the community leaders sitting down together and deciding on what crimes are you looking to divert, but again, to make sure it's equal throughout the county. And I hate to say you have to take that discretion away from that officer because one officer may treat someone differently because of their background. You have to make sure that playing field is equal throughout. Judge Burnett. Right now, the editorial board of the criminal law section has asked Scott Peterson, who is the person I mentioned was the program manager for grants for Justice Department and me to co-author an article for the next issue coming out this fall on a program called CAPS, Community Acceptance Program, convincing the community that a better way to deal with adults or senior citizens who may be, uh, have lapse in mental recollection, and walk in, pick up something in the store and walk out, they pay for some items and don't pay for others that they forgot they had or people who are retarded, or cases like the case where I have a 67-year-old woman before me for participating in a drug distribution because a drug dealer leaned on her and say, hey, you taking medication? Yeah, but I don't have money to get my prescriptions. So, well, look, if I give you 10 and you sell eight of them, then you can keep two to use for yourself. I had that case of that, she's never been in trouble in her life. And, and she was 67 years of age. I've had postal inspectors uh, bringing cases of government employees who under stress falsify records as to overtime to get more money to take care of sick patients or sick, re sick relatives. So we are looking at now creating an adult diversion program nationwide based on the youth court model to deal with those type of cases. The other type of cases involve the so-called aiders and abettors. The Kimber Smith case, mother and father, both school principals, outstanding student, fell in love with a guy who was a drug dealer. He got her pregnant, and he told her, look, answer that door, bitch. Otherwise, you and your baby and my baby sleep out in the car tonight. So she goes to prison for 10 years. I finally helped her with President Clinton to get clemency but never been in trouble. She had never come out being a spokesperson for modifying our mandatory minimum laws and so forth. So there are many adult cases where because of coercion, because of aiding and abetting in the work of our mandatory minimum laws, there will be suitable candidates. That one time event was that one mistake. They're not mass repeaters and yet they're sitting in prison now in the mandatory sentence. And so we're looking at establishing a CAP program, community acceptance program, where we convince the community that rather than adding to mass incarceration, a better way to increase safety and respect and reduce the cost of incarceration in this country is to come up with a adult model based on a youth court approach for cases of that type. Thank you, Judge. Roel, I was hoping you could uh tell us a little bit about the Diversion Standards Task Force and really the need for us to provide standards uh, so that we, we have something moving forward as things expand. Thank you, and this is not a paid political announcement, okay? So we, the, the, the criminal justice section set up a, a task force for diversion standards. As you may know, the section has, and the ABA in general has a lot of different task force, a lot of different standards. There hasn't been one. So for diversion, so we were, we've been working on it for about 18 months. Our reporter is Professor Ian Main here, who's from the University of Wisconsin Law School. So uh, we've broken it down into four different areas. Early diversion, which is law enforcement diversion programs. Early diversion for pre-filing diversion programs. Pre-plea diversion programs and post-plea diversion programs. And we're, our, our goal is to help assist in the development, implementation, and evaluation of diversion programs uh, across the board in these different intercepts. With respect to, to um, uh, law enforcement assisted programs, you know, we have some specific goals. And, and, we, and we, you know, the, the task force, or the standards, I should say, are utilized to help guide you know, either individuals or entities to try to implement these types of programs, right? They're, they become, at some point, official ABA policy in how to, how to uh, do uh, or how to conduct certain business in, in our line of work. So 
With respect to early diversion, uh, early diversion programs, you know, we, we ask some of these are the basic uh, uh, provisions. Like we, we suggest that the program should provide for a program manager. Right? that, that uh, serves as a point of contact for all program partners, including the public, line officers, program staff, et cetera. That there be clear eligibility requirements that provide <clears throat> guidance to officers making decisions on the street. That uh, we formalize and manage agreements with service providers, right? so that we know where we're gonna send them, that they're licensed, that they have pro you know, proper staff, that we can follow up. Uh, uh, with them, et cetera. Um, that we provide guidance as to development of law enforcement resources, overtime approval process, because it does take sometimes additional time, and shift scheduling issues that may result from program impl implementation or demands. That we uh, assist with coordination with the prosecutor, defense counsel, and any court where appropriate, particularly when a participant has uh, cases pending before or after they're admitted to a law enforcement diversion program. And that we, put, and that we suggest that there be ongoing training, of course, right? Uh, that facilitates an understanding of diversion objectives, harm reduction, addiction science, crisis intervention training, behavioral health, and, and evidence-based practices. And of course, a review of policies and gu guidelines as they go along. So that, that in a nutshell is what the standards in this particular area are set out to do. We're at a point now, I would suggest we're probably about 80% give or take done. We're, we're having a very select group of people taking a look at these different standards to give us real world feedback, even though we have a pretty robust uh, task force, including Karen, myself, Professor Nyon, and, and uh, incoming president, or excuse me, chairperson of the criminal justice section, amongst others, uh, to try to refine them and to make sure that uh, they cover the full panoply of uh, re resources out there, that we give uh, thoughtful um, and legitimate guidance. We're doing the standards and we're also simultaneously working on commentary so that uh, by the time we're done, hopefully, uh, we'll get them to the standards committee. They'll take a look at it. We'll make any fine tuning, get it to the uh, council for their review, and ultimately to the ABA House of Delegates for adoption. So, um, if you have any particular thoughts of that, or some of our experts here to take a look at that, or have some uh, interest, uh, please let us know. But uh, that's our goal: is to have some clear guidance for those that are working in the field. Also, I want to bring to your attention that Harvard University is planning on doing a five-year study of youth courts compared to juvenile justice with Global Youth Court uh, Incorporated and with Scott Peterson and myself. So we'll be working with them where they'll be doing a model based on the NIH approach uh, and coming up with empirical evidence of showing how well these programs work. And I've been told that I missed a question from the audience, so. Yeah, I have a question, thanks. And I, I, I'm not sure we're 8% down now after she always remarks, but. Um, <laughs> uh -oh. All right, 76.5. <laughs> reduced our percentage. Right. I'm not sure if we're capturing the kind of program that you're just How uh, how uh, How involved are your officers uh, after this initial point of contact um, with the version? Uh, it seems like your entire program is, is really is involved with these kids in a way that's much closer than I think the task force has envisioned such a program to be. So I just wanted a little more on that from you. They're very involved in it. The uh, We actually have someone that works for us is uh, Reverend Irby, our intervention officer. He's uh, Reverend Irby, he's our intervention person, so he's assigned, he's assigned directly to me, so he works with the detectives and the officers, so when these kids are diverted, uh, he can talk to the parents and also talk to the child to see how we can help them along. And then that child is assigned to a zone, we call our community service officer, our CSOs, they will follow up with that child to see what else they can do. And I might add, in Washington, D.C., the financial officer for the Metropolitan Police Department, the chief of police, and the entire senior staff has said, had I reached them earlier in the budget process, they would have included in that budget 
money for a diversion program as opposed to their officers being diverted to respond to schools to deal with school disorder cases or dealing with uh, unlawful molestation of a teenage girl or, or so forth. And they are strongly backing the Florida approach at this point, even to the point of including as part of the police budget money to fund a youth court operation. And a lot of chiefs looking at it, we're talking about resources, so you don't have to worry about transporting a child to the facility, uh, the man hours, the uh, resources with that, reports. Uh, so all that resource that you're tying up to take that child from point A to point B to the detention center, you can take that out. Then you have to take out the gas costs. There's a lot. When you start backing out all that, you're saving a lot of money. Yeah. So we have another question. Um, these programs are amazing. I think it's fantastic. And wherever you see the problem solving uh, situation, whether it's a court, I don't know enough about law enforcement yet, um, there's sometimes a very limited number of people who participate. When you're talking about diversion programs to a provider and how many people can that provider hold, I mean, is, it, has that, is that a realistic concern? Um, the availability, or, uh, you know, if you're in a jurisdiction that just doesn't have any more room in the programs, does that mean? What happens when the, when the law says shall and there isn't money for that diversion question? If that makes sense. Um, is there really any tension as far as how many people you can, you can participate? Um, and just I don't know how the officers have the time to do this, it's fantastic. And, I, and again, we're on our fourth year, and it is working be, because it's not that much. We're not tying up the court system. The child is, we call it immediate because you, you, you commit the crime today, so we're not waiting three or four months now to figure out what's going to happen to you. We're addressing it that week. They got a counselor. We work with our parks and rec department, so it's just that wraparound service. So we're going to pass you off to parks and recs because. In every city, you have lots of park and rec division, and they have a lot of program for kids. And sometimes, just opening those eyes up, open those kids' eyes up to those programs that are available to them. Because you, most of the time, while well, I have anything to do, this. so we have a lot of wraparound services that we add into that. We have uh, Feed Tampa Bay. So once a month, is it food? You know, so that counselor is really asking that child, why did you commit this crime, and what can I get you on the back end? <clears throat> Can I answer on behalf of like a different type of program? So I know that um, a lot of when the drug diversion program started, that was one of the main problems because like a law enforcement officer will look at you and say, I would love to divert, but divert to what? That's the biggest thing you hear is divert to what? And so um, in Dayton, Ohio, where they had, um, this is so sad, refrigerated trucks in their, um, next to their morgue because they had so many overdoses, they had no place to put the bodies. Um, Dayton is a comeback story because they had to get everybody, all the stakeholders together, including the hospital, public health, behavioral health, law enforcement, the justice system, everybody together. And they got together and they created, and the, and the state government. And they got funding and they created treatment capacity. They had to create treatment capacity within the county, like within the city. And um, there are some fantastic articles about it. But a community has to come together and create treatment capacity. And that SIM is one way to do it, um, to look at your, your gaps and where they are and how they can um, be, you know, how you can come together and fill in those gaps to do that. And um, oh, there was a really good um, Vox article about it a little while ago that had a lot of uh, legs to it. But, um, you know, that's, youth are, are one issue. The drug problem is one issue. Mental health, um, Tucson, Arizona, the Tucson Police Department is a national model. They have a triage center. Pennington County, which is Rapid City, South Dakota, just built um, a $12 million, um, like, one-stop shop for, um, family violence and uh, mental health issues and um, all kinds of stuff, just like this, they bought this big abandoned, oh, it used to be a, like a university and they reconfigured it and now it's like a one-stop shop for like a community center where police can drop off mental health victims, um, homeless victims that need medical treatment and things like that. And you just have to build capacity and, and you, I can't say just, but. Last piece on that, um, are these, are the people who participate staying within the criminal justice jurisdiction, or are they participating under some health 
jurisdiction. Well, do you mean like do they come from other communities or? I, I think um, you're asking if whether or not right. they're charged or within the system. If it fails to show up or doesn't right. participate, well, I imagine there's still going to be some hammer over the head uh, that will come back and do that. So there would have to be some. If it's a deflection program, there's no hammer because it's a deflection program where they never entered. The type of model. Well, that's, right. Yeah. If it's the type of program where there are charges held in abeyance, they have to finish it, a program. Okay. It depends on the model. Yes, we have another question. Are you aware of any of these programs uh, address uh, issues of gun violence? Uh, divert, uh... Yes. Okay. There's this program called <laughs> Gun Bail that nobody has adopted yet. It's called Gun Bail. It's, um, it was started by this uh, man named Trevor Brooks. It, Brooks. It's an app that police can use um, where if they arrest somebody, um, they, it's like a call for service and, and they arrest somebody. Um, they will ask him, do you have any illegal firearms at home? Because if they're on them, they can't participate. But do you have any illegal firearms at home? And if you do, if you can get your support system, somebody from your family or a friend or something to take it to, um, what do they call them, the, like, uh, this a pawn shop or something like that, and they have the app and they can tell the person exactly where to take it and drop it off. And they'll take that person down to the police station and wait to get confirmation that that gun has been dropped off. While they're at the police station, somebody, a co-responder that works with that program will meet with that person and find out what kind of services they need if they do need services and work with that person as part of the program to get that person into a SUD program, a mental health program or something like that. Now he had started to work with the St. Louis Police Department but new leadership came in and so Johns Hopkins was going to evaluate it and it didn't work out at all. So he's trying He's working like with the New Orleans prosecutor to try to get it adopted. He's working with Baltimore to try to get it adopted. So far, no takers. So, yeah, that would be amazing. And and he came to us, and we thought that it was really neat. And so we've been working with some of our projects, like Safety and Justice, talking to some people there. We have a project called Collective Healing. We've been working with some agencies that to try to like push it a little bit. I think we have time for one last question. Um, so I've been on both sides of the issue as a prosecutor. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. And we talk about that a lot in the Safety and Justice Challenge as well. And we talked a lot about it when we were working on bail reform especially. And one thing that we talked about is that when stakeholders come together, they have to be ready to talk about these are, now, okay, I just said that uh, pre-arrest diversion is not evidence-based yet. We're working on it. But programs like um, bail reform, and, and other criminal justice reform programs, they work really hard to make sure that they're evidence-based. And when stakeholders come together and they tell their communities, these are evidence-based programs, but we're talking about human beings. So if we use a risk assessment tool that's been validated for this community, and we work really, really hard to make sure that these are safe, because what we really care about is public safety, but we also care about fairness and transparency and real justice, we're going to implement these programs, but we're never going to throw one of our own under the bus, and we're going to come together as a unified group. And if a tragedy happens, we're going to face the music together and say, we're human beings, and this was a human being, and there are anomalies, and this is good for the entire system. It's good for public safety, and sometimes tragedies happen, but we're going to stick with this program because it's better for everyone and we're the stakeholders and we're sticking together. So we tell people you have to come together as stakeholders and stick with your program. You know, if you believe in it enough to, to, 
to plan it and implement it together stay together. I really appreciate the, uh, the panel and all of the thoughtful answers uh, to the questions. Uh, as you can see, uh, law enforcement, um, they are problem solvers by nature. They, they are in the thick of these matters every day. And the examples that you've seen to, uh, today are just the tip of the iceberg. There are multiple different programs all across the country where people are trying to deal with the unique uh, challenges that their communities are facing. So uh, we applaud the uh, people on the stage and uh, all the different entities out there uh, doing this good work. Uh, I believe our uh, panelists are available if any of you have questions afterwards. Uh, but thank you very much. Thank you for your attention and your attendance.